Living with depression has been the biggest ongoing obstacle of my life. Even though I learned to overcome the situations that it comes with, you never forget what those terrible moments were like. The days where even your favorite food or gift wouldn't cause you to crack a smile. Sadly, many people think depression is just another way of saying you're feeling sad. This misconception can lead to a person not getting the help that they need because people do not take them seriously. That's why I'm going to be talking about this. I'm going to be talking about this thing that I've lived with for decades. I'm going to be talking about my unwanted partner, depression. Welcome everybody to the sixth episode of Happy to Fail, the podcast where you and I sit down together and we learn from one another. We share experiences, we share the problems, but we also share the solution to those problems. We motivate each other and we also motivate those loved ones that are going through something, but we gotta go out there, we gotta learn what is it like to live with depression? What is it like to, to live with anxiety? What does that look like? What is the thought process of that person that simply wants to transform their life because they want to be able to pursue a job, a career, own a car, have a debt, have a family, have whatever it is that they want. But because of the constant discrimination or misconception or, or social media isation, as I sometimes like to say it, people don't take them seriously. My name is Juan Velas Court. I am from Puerto Rico. And I am proudly a person with lived experience when it comes to mental health challenges. Consider going back to the first podcast episode if you haven't, because that one goes over more details about what this podcast is about. But long story short, because it is important for this episode, I was uh, diagnosed with uh, generalized anxiety, depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder. And this began when I was six years old, and it got progressively worse as time went by because of that stigma, because of people just looking at me a different way, because of people just not taking my emotional health as seriously as they should have my physical health. We need to treat depression with the recognition it deserves, with the respect that it deserves, because we lose so many people because of this unwanted partner that walked into our lives they didn't open the door, they broke in, and they don't want to leave. So extreme trigger warning because we will be talking about depression, obviously, but as well as suicide and what is it like to live with depression. So if this show is your source of motivation to, to make a leap, to make a positive change in your life, but you're going through something that is maybe a little bit sensitive right now, don't listen to this episode if you feel like you can be triggered. And if you feel like you need some support, don't hesitate to contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit suicidepreventionlifeline.org. And if you're from Puerto Rico like myself, there is AMSCA's 24-7 crisis line, known as Lina Paz, available at 1-800-981-0023. So because this is such a serious topic, I was thinking to myself, what is an opening statement that I can do? Because I can talk about what depression is, clinically speaking, and I do have some information about that because it is important to educate each other about that. But I actually wrote something. It's not a poem because I can't rhyme, but it's something that I feel summarizes what depression is like for me. So without further ado, I would like to read what was written by yours truly. Depression is the partner that I never wanted but was stuck with. He didn't care whether he took a shower or not, went to school or not, or if there were piles of clothes in his room. Why should he care? It's something he always asked himself, but never found an answer. Depression would get his ideal birthday gift, and his mother made him his favorite meals. Yet it all did not matter to him. All his mind could focus on was, does it matter? If someone had a problem, depression automatically assumed it was his fault. I, Juan Velas Court, met this person, met this thing called depression. Depression and I hung out together every day because we both felt this misery and were misunderstood by others. I remember people would always ask me, Juan, why are you so sad? I would have given my life at that moment to feel sad because it would have meant that I actually felt something. Depression and I had a couple of pastimes together. We laid in my bed, staring at the ceiling for hours, and loved to cry uncontrollably for hours for no particular reason. I didn't exactly love my relationship with depression, but eventually 
depression persuaded me to embrace the emptiness because it was what I began to feel as well. Throughout time, I realized that although I embraced my relationship with depression, it was killing me, literally, physically, emotionally. I started doing things that I will someday reveal to the world, but let's just say that they should have led me to death. Looking back, I shouldn't be alive right now. I really shouldn't. I became the best actor that I knew because I could smile on occasion just to hide all the pain. People will think I was having an excellent time. Juan was finally overcoming those mental health obstacles. But deep inside, I felt this emptiness that I never thought I could get out of. And I left it up until that point because I feel like that can summarize what depression, what living with depression was like. Because we're going to be moving on here for a couple of minutes to, to cover the basics about what really is depression. So that way, between that and what I just mentioned, I can go over some specific details about specific events that happened, but then ultimately, how was I able to, to, to be able to begin to get out of that? Because it is one of the most challenging things that I've ever done in my life. The following information comes to us from psychiatry.org. Depression symptoms can vary from mild to severe and can include feeling sad or having a depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure in activities once enjoyed, changes in appetite, weight loss or weight gain unrelated to dieting, trouble sleeping or sleeping too much, loss of energy or increased fatigue, increased and purposeless physical activities like pacing and walking around a lot or slowed movements and speech, feeling worthless or guilty, difficulty in thinking, concentrating, or making decisions, and thoughts of death or suicide. They also have some statistics here that I feel like I need to bring up. Depression affects an estimated 1 in 15 adults. That is 6.7% in any given year. And 1 in 6 people, that is 16.6%, will experience depression at some point in their life. Depression can strike at any time, but on average, first appears during the late teens to mid-20s. Women are more likely than men to experience depression. Some studies show that one-third of women will experience a major depressive episode in their lifetime. Being sad is not the same as having depression. This is also from the website, and I feel like I have to repeat that one. Being sad is not the same as having depression. The grieving process is natural and unique to each individual and shares some of the same features of depression. Both grief and depression may involve intense sadness and withdrawal from usual activities. Depression can include sadness, but sadness is not depression. Like I mentioned in the opening of the episode, I wish I would have felt something because living with depression makes you feel indifferent, even if you have the thing that you care about the most. To bring up an example, going as far back as 1999, which is when my mother started developing these support groups in Puerto Rico for people with anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. Sure, I was way too young to actually help others at that time, but I listened a lot. And something that made a significant impact in my life was that the people that needed the highest level of peer support or emotional support of any kind were the people that had a lot of the things that you and I would aspire would aspire to have, like a car, like traveling around the world, because as much as we want to complain, and I feel like you're going to be in with me in this, those challenges along the way that are not related to mental health, we're talking about saving money, wanting to buy a car, wanting to buy a house, as much as we complain about the steps along the way, they feel so satisfying because when you actually put that payment on the house, on the car, or when you finish paying that debt. Doesn't that feel amazing? It just feels incredible because it was all about you. You did that. But when somebody doesn't have that, that barrier, all of a sudden, those goals that you and I could have, it would take 10 years to, to accomplish. For them, they've already done it. So that lack of motivation as to what should I do now often led to increased levels of anxiety, emptiness, no self-fulfillment because they don't know what it's like to live with that struggle. So it is interesting that a lot of times we look, we look at the, the rich people, the people that are millionaires, and we ask ourselves, well, how can they have problems? They can have problems 
just like anybody else can because of money, it can solve problems that can reduce the sense of sadness, but money doesn't automatically increase happiness. Maybe it does temporarily, but eventually you get accustomed to any life that you're living with. But going back to what it was like for me to live with depression, I felt like I was going to drown. I felt like whenever something happened in my life, I just could not emotionally manage it. Even when good things happened, there is that thought process in the back in the back of my head telling me, Juan, you don't deserve that. How dare you? How dare you be happy? How dare you feel like you're making a change in your life? You go bad because you deserve nothing but the worst. You are completely worthless. And you always have that. So even when when somebody would pay would pay me a compliment, I just would not believe it. Even going as far back as like the, these past couple of years. One of my biggest problems because of that is to to just accept something. I've had people even with the podcast just tell me, Juan, thank you. You know, you've you've actually made a change in my life or, you know, thank you for doing this. Even today, I still struggle with just acknowledging that. I actually get very awkward because I know that the person means nothing but the best. But having those things in the back of your head made you scared of success, scared of failure because... It was a loose, loose situation. It felt like it didn't matter what happened in my life. It was either my fault or I had something to do with it. It would have been better if I had not been involved. Think back to when you were at school. Say you didn't like sports. Say you're in your recreational class and you're playing dodgeball. I was always the last kid to be picked, whether it was basketball, dodgeball, baseball. And I felt like if my team lost, which a lot of times it really was the case because I was terrible, but it was because of me. If they had chosen anybody else, they would have won. Apply that to literally anything in my life. And I think that can also help give you some context about what it is like to live with depression. And this is where the trigger warnings come back. This did lead to multiple suicide attempts and even more suicide uh, ideations or just thoughts about ending my life. But here's the thing. People assume that if you're depressed, if you're living with depression, automatically what you want is suicide. Suicide to me at that point was an escape because I was tired of feeling the way I was feeling. But it came to a point in time where I even talked about this with my psychologist where no longer did I not want to commit suicide, I just did not want to live. Think about that. It's not that I wanted to take a knife to my heart. It's not that I wanted to throw myself off a car, which I actually did try, and my mother held me, and that fortunately did not happen. But then it became the case of, well, I don't want to kill myself, but I don't want to live. So what what happens now? That's when, at around 14, 15 years old, things got really bad. I was supposed to be hospitalized at that point, but uh, again, even though I was hospitalized prior to that in the state of Wisconsin, but It didn't happen, even though my mother really tried. Uh, The system at that point was not as welcoming in Puerto Rico as it should have been. So I just stopped caring because here I am thinking, I don't want to end my life, but I don't want to live. I want to look for help, but the help doesn't want to help me. So, um, okay, I guess I'm just going to do nothing. And that's pretty much what I did. So for years, for many, many years... Up until I was 19, 20 years old, my life from 14 to 19 was nothing. It it truly was irrelevant. I'm talking, I would wake up at night usually, sleep during the day. I would go to my psychologist or psychiatrist. I was at the same school from fifth grade all the way way to senior year. And even then, people would still ask me, oh, are you a new student? It's like, no, I'm just... I'm the special case. People don't really want to deal with me. And honestly, I can blame them. Like I really, and I've said this in a previous episode, I can't thank those teachers enough because they were very, very patient with me because I don't think I would have been as patient with somebody else. But you see people just move on with their lives. And think about the context that at that point, yeah, I had internet. I actually had some friends there, but we didn't have your Twitters, your Instagrams, your Facebooks. There was MySpace at that point, and I didn't have an account. So at that point, it was just not normal for me to to know about other people. But by the time I got to 19, 20 years old, that did become accessible in the couple of years before that. So my problem was that 
I began to see people just having positive lives, people getting older, people that were my age and that I had seen them and now they're working and now they're doing different things. And the thing with depression is that you want to be able to do something, but it's almost like your body is chained up to this bed. I stopped brushing my teeth, not for days, people. I'm talking months, even if my mother forced me, because rightfully so as a mother, you're like, for the love of God, brush your teeth. Why? Why should I? Where am I going? Who am I going to see? Who's going to come to my birthday? Guess what? It's a bunch of family members and not one person my age because nobody, and I mean nobody, wants to spend time with me. That is a little bit of what it's like to live with depression. I could easily talk about this in more detail. So if you would like me to do that, please let me know. But I do want to spend a couple of minutes talking about how did I combat that depression? The first thing, and this is going to be a quick list for those that want to know, recognize that depression is not something I chose to live with, and it's always lurking there. Nowadays, do I still struggle with depression? Absolutely, people. This is, this is not magically cured. This is not something that was a thing of the past. It is very much active, but it is, it is not something that, it's not that I don't pay attention to it. It's that I focus on the things that actually matter in my life. And, and as a result, I, I end up overcoming and just dominating that depression. But I always need to accept the fact that I didn't choose this. This was bestowed upon me and I can battle that all I want, or I can actually begin to work on it. Another thing that really helped me is to learn from others. Even in the support group, my mom and I began traveling to different states to just learn about mental health and depression. And even when I would hear doctors that live through depression and still go through it, but they were able to make a positive change, I'm like, that's what I needed to hear. That is a doctor with a fancy car, he's traveling, I wanna be able to get to that route and having that source of motivation, that reference, truly did help me. I also began doing different positive activities from my home. That's around the time where I began cooking, and I would have my mom taste the dishes and asking her, you know, is this something you like? Do you have any recommendations? How would you do this differently? I was still scared to go wow because I was, I was tired. I hated the world, but my mother was always there, and I'm forever thankful for that. So I thought to myself, well, if I'm, if I'm self-bounded to these four walls, I may as well make the best of it. A really important one is that I began to surround myself with positive people. Just because somebody is of the same blood family-wise as you doesn't mean you have to spend time with them, people. Most of those people damaged me. I still have to accept some of, the, some of the trauma that I lived through because of my father, because of his side of the family, and I realized, let it go. Let it go. You're not bound to them anymore. I said I wouldn't sing on the podcast, so I do want to apologize for that. But it's true. The moment that I was able to let it go, let it go, and only accept positive people in my life, guess what? I began to think positively. That was so infectious that the people that are involved now just care about my mental health. They just care about me feeling better, and that truly helped me. So it's not just focusing on the positive people, but any negative thing that you can remove, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, personal life, professional life, where you live, the state that you're at, something that is in your car, that cockroach in your car that just will not go away, any little thing that you can remove that will make you feel better as a result, people, you kick that thing in the face Emotionally speaking, okay, I'm not condoning physical violence here. Very important. I do want to clarify that, but you know what I mean, right? Something else that helps is that I can't take a vacation from working with my depression. Yeah, I don't focus on it 24-7, but I need to realize that there's going to be good days and there's going to be some just awful, awful days and they still happen. So I got to promote self-care activities, something as simple as stretching in the morning, getting a good night's sleep, making sure I take care of my nutrition. I talked about five of my favorite activities that make me happy. That's an episode that's available right now. But those things truly do help because maybe none of them seem huge enough in the grand scheme of things, but collectively, they, they just transformed who I was and what I thought about. Something that's good, but it is also bad, is I need to stay active. I can't just sit down and do nothing. Sometimes I purposely plan that, like the sense of just sitting down and analyzing and contemplating, but 
if I feel like I don't have a goal to work towards to, that's when depression says, hey, Juan, remember me, buddy? I'm still here. I'm still crawling. I can definitely come back with a vengeance. And with remakes and movies, depression can definitely remake a, a much worse movie than the one that I lived through for many years. So I need to stay active. And a lot of times I will get tired. I'll slightly burn out because I'm a human being, people. I, I never want to sell myself as the best product ever. Juan is the example that depression doesn't exist anymore. Depression is very real. Depression is always there, but we don't have to be our depression. We can be Juan Velas Court or whatever your name is. And yeah, we have depression the same way we have hypertension or a knee problem. And some days they're good. Some days, some days the humidity and the weather makes that be a pain. It's all a matter of recognizing what you have to do. Now, something that is tied to needing to stay active is I always have to learn something new. Even if I don't like it, it's a matter of understanding what's cool out there. Even on Spotify, I'll sometimes put the top hits and I'll think to myself, what, what is this? But somebody likes that, so I, I guess I need to understand that so I know what's cool and hip in 2019. It's a matter of just throwing myself out there and learning. And sometimes I'll even go to a mall and just look at modern trends when it comes to clothing. It's not that I'm going to change what I'm wearing, but it is always stimulating my, my train of thought. It's stimulating my mind to always learn something. As I mentioned, I've applied that to things like baking, to things like exercising, where sometimes I get tired of doing the same routine over and over, so sometimes I'll switch to another one. Halfway through, I realize that eh, it's a little bit boring for me. I don't exactly like it, but I tried it, and I have that process where I sit down afterwards and I think to myself, what would you change? What would you fix about that? And you can just apply that to every little thing of your life but the last one, and I think it is the most essential and admittedly also the most difficult one, is to accept and embrace the good moments. I'm 29 years old, so think about the fact that the majority of my life has not been thinking of the way that I think right now. It's been focusing on the negative, the things that I deserve because I'm a worthless human being. So even today, even today, people... I still have to be able to just sit down and be like, you deserve this. You actually did something good from the moment that I get a paycheck to the moment that I, I, I'm able to pay my car to the moment that I spend time with friends. Even sometimes I'll admittedly stay quiet and it's this process of, Juan, just embrace the good things that are happening right now. Because the mind, people, the mind gets so creative and just telling you like, are they really your friends? Are you really having a good time, Juan? You could just sleep and go to bed and do nothing. And then you always have to fight through that. So it's led to the point where I've, I've gotten tired a lot easier than other people, where I sometimes even fall asleep. And those that don't understand will look at it and go like, did Juan not sleep well? It's like, oh, I am an expert at sleeping, people. I'll easily sleep six to eight hours every day because I'm... I respect my sleeping pattern and I love it, right? It's, it's my time to recuperate my body. But accepting, being able to just have a situation that happens, even professionally, sometimes people will ask me to go to a workshop or give a workshop, right? And I just think to myself, like, this is something that thousands of people could give you know, a workshop about, yet they choose me. How dare they? Like, do they realize like, that? No, Juan. You're actually good at this. The reason that they're choosing you is because you are not worthless. You are worth it. So if there's one, one final message that I can give you for this podcast episode, you're probably damn good at something that you do and you don't give yourself enough credit. This is something that I would have loved to have told myself when I was 15, 16 years old so I would have been able to live my life in a much more positive light. Think about the things that you do, and whenever you make a mistake, think about the fact that everybody, everybody, people makes mistakes from the lowest level to the highest level. Everybody makes mistakes, and it's not focusing on that. It's focusing on, yeah, I made a mistake today, but look in, in the grand scheme of things. Look at how many awesome things I've been able to do, how many awesome things I've been able to accomplish, because yeah, depression is not cured. It doesn't magically go away. 
but you can damn sure control it. You can make sure that it doesn't it doesn't dominate you. You can dominate depression and you can do that with positive activities, with positive people, by caring about yourself, by focusing on yourself, and by knowing that you, and I got to say this like a hundred times, you are worth it. When this episode ends, tell yourself you're worth it. When you have a family member going through something, tell them you're worth it. It may seem insignificant to just say you are worth it, but when you hear it, when you analyze and you absorb it, you're like, I, I am worth it. I actually am. That's why I need to do these things. That's why I can inspire to do more because I deserve to do more. There was a podcast that I listened to a couple of weeks ago. I forget the name, but I heard something that I can definitely resonate with. There's not nearly as many bad people in this world as we make it out to be. We have a lot of people that make bad decisions. If I think back to all the bad decisions that I made in my life, we would never end from insulting people to punching somebody to just doing all these terrible things that somebody externally speaking could look at and go, Juan is a bad kid. Juan is a bad person. How dare you help Juan? Help the other person, but you don't know what's going through my head. You don't, you don't know what it's like to live the life of Juan. I have a caring mother but that doesn't magically mean that I have no problems. You know, each person is individual, and we need to respect that individuality, which I don't even know if it's a word, but I said it. But that's what it's all about. So I actually want to leave you with a recommended resource, and it's a follow-up to what we're talking about right now. This is a TEDx talk titled, I'm Fine, Learning to Live with Depression by Jay Tyler. As of that recording, he was 31 years old, and he shared some of the activities that help him manage his depression. And I listened to that, and I thought to myself, like, this is what it's all about. We're not alone, people. If you look at the statistic that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, 1 in 15, 1 in 15, 6.7%. So in addition to, to saying you're worth it, don't assume that depression is something that everybody goes through. Everybody can live through depression. Everybody can suffer from depression, but not everybody has it. We can't just generalize. We can't use uh, uh, depression as an adjective. We can't use depression as, oh, I felt, I'm feeling a little bit depressive today because the person that is actually living through it, that's not what we want from this world. We don't want to be reminded that depression, anxiety has bec have become these mainstream terms. As people that suffer through this, Let's respect that. The same way we respect anything else, we need to respect depression. So if you'd like me to talk about this in more detail, please let me know because it's a very difficult topic. Even writing this agenda, I think it was the most challenging agenda because there's so many layers of depression. And honestly, it's not unless sometimes people ask me about my past that I remember it. Because it's not that you're blocking it out, it's that you really do forget because you've replaced so much of the bad with the good that the bad just kind of goes away, which is a good problem to have. But as somebody that wants to continually motivate others based on my experiences, if you have questions, hit me up on Twitter. Happy to fill. Same thing with Instagram and Facebook. You can also send me an email to Juan at happy to fail .com. And the next podcast episode, people, we talked about living with depression and I talked about the, the importance of always needing to, to, to stay active, to be active. That's why the next episode is going to be about making new goals. I don't just want to focus on 2009 Juan, 1999 Juan. I want to focus on everything that I lived through because every experience, whether it's from the past, present, or future, build who I am. And I feel like you can definitely relate to that. So that's going to be that episode. And if you want to help support this podcast, you can leave a review on Apple Podcast and or Stitcher, leave a five-star rating, and let people know what you think about this. You can share clips on social media. On Instagram TV, happy to fail, I'm actually posting segmented episodes. So because it has a 10-minute time limit, I'm doing that because I just want this to be out there. If we can help even one person to make a positive change in their lives, that, ladies and gentlemen, that is what this is all about. So take care. See you next time. And remember, you are worth it.